welcome to our live stream of Heavenly Memories. We're going to be uh, wrapping up our study tonight. This is our last time together, and it's, uh, it's going to be exciting. I'm looking forward to it. It's hard to believe we were talking just a minute ago. This is our ninth conversation, ninth evening uh, together talking about heaven. And uh, it's been quite a journey. We've covered a lot of different topics and we've really enjoyed having an opportunity from time to time to interact with questions that you've sent in. And so you'll see on your screen there a number that you can text questions to. So if tonight you have any remaining questions about heaven, this is your last chance to ask them. Not really, but it is our last time together for these conversations. And so if you have any questions, we'd love to have you send those in. And if we have the opportunity, we'll try to work our way through those as well. But as we get started, Andy, it might be helpful to just kind of talk about some of the ground that we've covered because sure. it's been a lot. So what are some of those topics? All right. So we're talking about meditations on heaven and the Bible has told us a good deal about our heavenly future. And it exhorts us in many places to meditate on our future heavenly life. And I think we should end tonight by talking about the benefits of heavenly meditation, how it'll help us. And we'll get to all that. But uh, we've talked about how the central issue of heaven is the glory of God. Mm -hmm. That uh, when we are in heaven, we will be forever immersed in and delighting in and worshiping the glorious God. Uh, part of the idea of my book, though, is that a, an aspect of our discovery and delight in the glory of God will be a backward look at the history of life in this present age. And all that God did, the mighty works of God in redeeming a people for himself out of every tribe and language and people and nation, and saving us, glorifying us up in heaven, that there's a lot of material there to cover and that God wants us to learn that. And mo mm -hmm. most of it, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So the idea is we will never be omniscient, but we will be forever learning God in heaven. And part of that will be that backward look. And so we went from that to talk about how much material there is. Mm -hmm. 6,000 years of redemptive history. We had that big wall chart <laughs> of all the details, every nation, every individual, the forest and the trees, the massive scope and dimensions, and then the details. Uh, actually, those words have been very much in my mind mm. recently. Dimensions and details, uh, the, the magnitude of the love of God expressed in Christ, and then the tiny details of what God's done along the way. We've talked about uh, rewards, uh, varying levels of rewards. We've talked about the resurrection body and mind and heart. Um, we have covered all kinds of things, the remembrance of our sins and why that will be there, but not cause any pain or shame, but just in order to fill out the story. So those are some of the things we've covered. That's great and helpful to set us up for tonight's two topics. Mm -hmm. the, the things that we're going to talk about tonight are our education in evil consummated in heaven. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, application of these meditations on heaven. Also, this idea of how much heaven do you want or um, that those ideas of, of rewards. Uh, any previews on what we're going to be looking at tonight in those two main headings? Well, we're about to dig right into the education and evil consummated, so I'll reserve that for just a moment from now when you ask me what I mean by that. But, you know, just the idea that the history of wickedness, the history of sin will be available for a certain purpose in heaven, and we'll talk about that. Again, it won't cause us any grief or sorrow, etc., but just understanding evil in its nature. Uh, we'll get to that. And then in terms of the, uh, the application, I think it's just going to be important for us to learn how to take our heavenly meditations and put them to work for us right here and now. You know, before we get to that first topic, Andy, you did your PhD, your dissertation uh, on Calvin and I believe Calvin's eschatology, eschatology right? Yeah. So as we probe deeply into these subjects that most people have never thought about before, yeah. how do we avoid unhealthy speculation? I think Calvin has some things to even say sure. to that point. Yeah, I would say the central thing that I learned from John Calvin about eschatology more than anything else is how much he hated <laughs> eschatological speculation. People do a lot of it. They're always kind of speculating about the future, you know, the second coming of Christ, end time events, all of those things, and on into eternity. And Calvin really did not like speculation. He was very, very careful and cautious about that. I wonder if that's probably why he never wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation, mm. that he might have found it difficult to write without speculating to some degree. Um, there's a quote that uh, I got from Calvin's Institutes here, and he warns about limitations that we should put on our heavenly meditation. Hmm. And he's specifically talking about speculation. This is what Calvin said. 
And although we have advanced considerably in this meditation on the future life, let us nevertheless acknowledge that if our mental capacity be compared with the height of this mystery, we still remain at the very lowest roots. Mm -hmm. In this matter, we must all the more then keep sobriety, lest forgetful of our limitations, we should soar aloft with the greater boldness and be overcome by the brightness of the heavenly glory. Let me stop there and say, I think he has a classical image in mind of a man named Icarus who made uh, some wings so that he could soar and fly and I guess escape some kind of prison that he was in or something like that. But as he soared too high, the heat from the sun melted the wax and he tumbled to his death. So it's a picture of overweening confidence and boldness and he's using that for speculation. You're soaring up so high, you end up tumbling back to earth if you go up too high and you're not careful. Mm. Then to continue the quote, Calvin said, we also feel how we are titillated by an immoderate desire to know more than is lawful. Mm. From this trifling and harmful questions repeatedly flow forth. Trifling, I say, for from them no profit can be derived. So that's like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, those kind of questions about heaven. But the second kind is worse because those who indulge in them entangle themselves in dangerous speculations. Accordingly, I call those questions harmful. Mm -hmm. So there's like minutia that titillates our interest and we have no biblical grounds for answering. And then there are actually, we can get to places that are, are unorthodox. They're, they're, not, they're harmful. So I get that, and I think that's a, a warning well taken. However, I don't think that's what's going on or what I'm trying to do in my book. What I'm trying to do is take sound exegesis and derive from it theological building blocks and principles, which we can then put together in logical deductions that build a theology. Honestly, that's what all theologians do about every topic. Because the Bible is, is a finite book with infinite dimensions. And so you're just drawing from it truths, putting them together, and building a theology. I'm just doing that when it comes to heaven. That's really helpful. So, as we avoid harmful or... Uh, what was the other trifling. word? Trifling. Trifling. <laughs> Not a word I use very often, so no, thanks trifling, for that. Right, yes. Trifling and harmful speculation. We're going to avoid that. But let's talk about this first topic. So, this idea of our education in evil being consummated. What do you mean by our education in evil. Okay, so I'm thinking about the span of redemptive history. And evil entered the universe in the fall of Satan, it seems, before man was even created. The serpent was ready to go when Adam and Eve were put in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. So he'd already fallen, Satan already fallen. So that happened before, after angels were created, but before perhaps man was created. Um, but then, of course, you've got the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan is there in the, in the guise of a serpent, tempting Eve and, and also Adam as they're standing at the, at the tree. And the tree has a very clear name, and we know what it is. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, Satan tempted uh, the woman and the man who was standing there with uh, her, excuse me, <coughs> tempted them, saying, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Mm -hmm. And so it says that, that Eve saw that the tree was good for food and, and desirable to make one wise. So when she ate and gave some to her husband who was also with her and he ate, and in Adam we sinned, we all then began uh, on the basis of a desire to know, mm -hmm. which is why I use the language of education. Well, what is it we've learned? Well, we've learned evil. And it's been 6,000 years of learning it. Mm -hmm. It's an education that we've had in evil. And when we get to heaven, I believe that education will be consummated or perfected. We will understand evil, its, its history, its dimensions, um, its details, and we will hate it as God hates it. So that's a completion of the education of evil. Now, the alternative is that we know nothing about evil in our glorified state. And there are significant problems with that, so we can talk about that, sure. but it's what I would call kind of a memory wipe in which we're up there extremely positive without any kind of knowledge. We're actually naive in heaven about evil, and that doesn't seem to be at all what God has intended in our final salvation. 
Yeah, and I think as we as we talk about heaven, I think for some, you know, thinking about heaven as such a happy, beautiful place, free right. completely from all evil things, it might be odd to, to bring mm -hmm. this in. But let me read Revelation 21, 26, and 27, okay. and then uh, ask a follow-up question to what I just said. Mm -hmm. So Revelation 21, verses 26 and 27 says, The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it, Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Mm -hmm. So since that's the case, mm -hmm. why would we spend any time looking backward at the ugly past, and why not just move on ahead into the mm -hmm. glorious eternal future? Well, that's a very good question, and I think that that verse does show that there are limitations to what's admitted into the society of heaven. So evil people and demons are not coming in. They're not crashing the party. But bad topics can be considered to nothing but good ends. So we can consider evil to the good end of hating it. Now, this is where if I start to make a case for why we must remember evil when we get to heaven, first of all, we could ask simply, what was the point of it all? What was the point of that journey that we've made, that six thousand year journey in redemptive history if we didn't learn anything if if all of the lessons that could have been learned are lost with a weird memory wipe after judgment day i guess we get to heaven and we have literally no memory of the past uh, what was the point of all of it all of the lessons everything that we could have learned are gone um, beyond that uh, the consummation of our salvation one could say is uh is recorded for us in Romans 8, 29, it says that we know that in everything God works for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose. For those whom God foreknew, mm -hmm. he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among, among many brothers. That's our destination, to be conformed to Christ. Or honestly, in the end, to be in, in consummation and perfection made like God created and recreated to be like God, as God originally intended, created in his image, mm -hmm. then perfected into the image of his son. Now, here's the thing. Hebrews 1.9 says that, that God the Father loves Jesus because, it says, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Mm -hmm. Therefore, God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Uh, God the Father loves Jesus because in his essential nature, he loves righteousness and hates wickedness. So if we're conformed to Christ, we must be the same. We must love righteousness and hate wickedness. If we have that weird memory wipe and no memory of evil at all, we will only love righteousness. Mm -hmm. And then we will not be conformed to Christ. We must both love righteousness and hate wickedness. And in heaven we will. Yeah, I love that. So that's a helpful, positive image of, of what it means to be conformed to the image mm -hmm. of Christ with both that... Uh, love for righteousness and hatred of wickedness. So as we are, as God the educator, God the visionary instructor, as we've talked in the past, how God will not merely tell us, but show us. He will tell because words are essential, but also visions of what happened and, and a beautiful marriage of visionary and verbal, those things going together. Then we see the unfolding of a story and we see martyrs dying, let's say, and there's evil involved there. But the 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 effect on us will only be positive in our heavenly perspective. Yeah. There'll be no fear and loathing. There'll be no shame or any of that. There'll just be delight in the, the glory of God in all of that. That's what we're going to get. And we'll also honor our brothers and sisters mm -hmm. for their courage, for their wisdom and answering rebuttals to sound doctrine, all of that. So you've got to have the dark side and the negative side to tell the story. So are there other reasons God would want us to understand the history of evil when we're safely in heaven? Okay, so I'm going to give you three reasons, one I've already hinted at. Number one, uh, we will have a review of a comprehensive education of evil, what it is in its dimensions and details. We will have that, number one, so that God will be glorified in having defeated mm. such a stubborn, resilient, relentless foe. Mm. I mean, evil just, it was tough to beat. And you look at the history of sin and how it metastasizes like cancer, how it doesn't stay put, it just keeps developing and growing, how you have them eating a piece of fruit, not to minimize it, but that's what they did in chapter 3, 
And the next chapter, Cain is murdering his brother. By the end of, of Genesis 4, we've got Lamech, who's a polygamist and a murderer on a large scale. He's more of a tyrant mm. at that point. To the point where in Genesis 3, the thoughts and imaginations of human hearts were only evil all the time. Then you have a flood that wipes out every member of the human race, mm. except Noah and his family, eight souls in all. And a short time after they come off the ark, Noah's getting drunk and laying exposed in his tent. One of his sons is mocking him. There's a curse that goes down on his son for doing that. Within a couple chapters after that, uh, human beings are spreading out over the earth. And you've got the, the Tower of Babel. Before they spread, the languages are confused and the people are scattered. Mm -hmm. And they're arrogantly, in a satanic sort of sense, trying to ascend up to God, up to, up to heaven. Uh, it just keeps going. Then you have the, the Jewish people called out through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then, then from, uh, from Egypt, they are let out. But most of those, that generation doesn't even make it into the promised land. Their bodies are scattered through the desert because of their rebellion and their will, unwillingness to believe. Mm. They enter into the promised land. That generation fights valiantly and is filled with faith and obeys God and all that. But the next generation doesn't know anything about the great deeds of God. That's where the book of Judges begins. The fathers didn't tell the sons, and they go right into a cycle of corruption in the book of Judges. It just keeps on going. Mm -hmm. Then God raises up a king, but he falls into rebellion, King Saul. God raises up a series of kings, a series of prophets. You have the whole history of Israel. And it's not a good history. It's a history of sin mm -hmm. and of the people being warned and prophets being sent and the prophets being punished and even killed. Uh, then you have an exile because the people had fallen into the same pattern of sins as the Canaanites. They had intermarried uh, with the women there. They had been led into uh, idolatry and sin and all that. So they go into exile. A very small remnant is left. A small remnant comes back under Ezra and Nehemiah and all that. And they immediately begin to intermarry again and go down that same path again. Whereupon Ezra pulls out his hair in anguish. Haven't you learned anything? Then it continues. Now we go into the new covenant. God sends his son uh, he lives a sinless life, dies an atoning death. Then we have the gift of, of the indwelling Holy Spirit poured out, and we begin the church age, 2,000 years. How's it been? Well, <laughs> mixed at best. And we look at our own lives. And, and the very thing we hate, we do. And the thing we want to do, we do not do. This is a long, complex, stubborn history mm. of evil. It's, and, and evil is personified. Sin is personified. Sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. Paul uses that language about the law of God. There's nothing wrong with the law, but sin cleverly used it. Mm -hmm. And so we have this unfolding of, of sin even after the day of Pentecost, after the indwelling spirit. We have a battle with sin and with, with the indwelling spirit. It's a long, sad, tragic history. And much of it has not even finished yet. We look at the, the man of sin coming in, the general apostasy, the rebellion, mm -hmm. a time of great wickedness and escalation of evil. It's like a final crescendo of wickedness and sin and evil. And so that's the history kind of traced out biblically and in church history. And we look at that and we can't forget that. We need to remember so that, so that's the first reason that God is glorified in such a complex, devious, wicked foe as sin and wickedness being defeated only by the grace of God, though. Secondly, that we, the redeemed, may see it and delight in it. That we will see God's victory. We'll see how sin was, was destroyed mm. and defeated. Um, understanding it completely, we will see how God alone could defeat it. And he did. But then there's a third. We've talked a lot about this today. Yeah. And that is that a future fall into rebellion mm. in heaven will never happen, could never happen. And I believe that a knowledge of evil and our corresponding hatred of it will be part of the guarantee that we will never fall into satanic rebellion again, uh, which we won't. The Bible is very clear that we are going into eternal life and we will never perish. No one can snatch us out of heaven or out of God, God's hands. We are secure and safe. But why? Because positively we love righteousness, negatively we will hate wickedness. That's so helpful. Those three reasons helping us understand why why we would want to, to know mm -hmm. this. And I was even thinking as you were telling the story, right? Mm -hmm. Telling the story of uh, history throughout the Bible and even church history, 
how even now there's benefit for us to remember, but then also mm-hmm. for us to know in heaven that story will be important. Yeah, well. and there's some details. There are specific sins that we know have caused immense grief and sorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, pride is the b- biggest. But think about racism, for example. We just don't seem to be able to defeat it the way we want to. There's such a stubbornness mm. to it. And won't it be beautiful to see how thoroughly destroyed racism was when you have people from this group and this group coming together in perfect unity, yeah. but remembering, remembering where they each came from yeah. and remembering how bad racism was, therefore able to celebrate how the grace of God broke down barriers and dividing walls and made us truly one. Mm. Again, if we have that memory wipe we won't be able to celebrate that. Sure. But if we know that this group was from this persecuting, like the Hutus and the Tutsis, or we have, we have racial stre- uh, stress in our country, we have you know different groups in Asia, uh, all of it because of bitterness and, and sin, Imperial Japanese Army doing terrible things in China and lots of memories of that. We think about the story of Corey Ten Boom and how she had a very hard time shaking the hand of an SS guard mm. who had tormented her family in, in a concentration camp, but mm. later found Christ to see the beauty of that perfect reconciliation in heaven. Again, the backstory is important for that. We can celebrate grace that way. Yeah, I think about Revelation 7, how beautiful that will be because we know how impossible that is apart from God supernaturally working to redeem people from every tribe, language, people, and nation. So the backstory will enhance the worship. So that's Mm. pretty exciting. That's amazing. So uh, I think it's helpful, at least for me, it's helpful to have kind of some illustrations sometimes. So okay. how might the Center for Disease Control or mm-hmm. even something like the Holocaust Museum in Washington, right. D.C. help us understand this topic? Yeah, these are two analogies. As a preacher, I constantly am looking for ways to explain theological truths in everyday uh, expressions. And I was talking to, uh, to Rich Davis, who's a, a pathologist uh, who studies the spread of disease and toxins, and I'm sure COVID-19 will be a big part of their study going forward. But the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta has a repository of some of the nastiest pathogens, all of the nasty, nastiest pathogens that they can get their whole hands on. For the hands on, they don't want to touch them, but I mean, they can, they can uh, obtain and put in very, very safe storage. Um, some of the worst, the HIV virus, uh, the Marburg virus, and the worst killer of all time in terms of a pathogen, which is the variola virus that, that caused smallpox. Mm. Smallpox is one of the great triumphs of medical science because of inoculations, uh, a vast program of inoculations. Smallpox in December of 1979 was declared to be obsolete from planet Earth, except for some samples that were held onto. Mm. And so there's one uh, set of samples in the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and then there's another set in Moscow somewhere. Now, you may well ask, why don't you just destroy it? Let's yeah, get rid let's of it. let's be done with this. Well, and I was talking to Rich Davis about this. Like, one of the reasons they hold on is they've got to keep studying because they don't know that there might be some other sample somewhere, and they can use it again for inoculations and other things like that. But the whole thing's an analogy, all right? In heaven, there'll be no active samples of the virus, just an accurate memory of what racism did, Mm. what adultery did, Mm. what covetousness, what idolatry did in human history, to know each of those pathogens and study them so that we will not ever be diseased in that way again. That's Mm. the analogy I use with the Center for Disease Control. And that's basically the Holocaust Museum's the same kind of image. If any of you have been there, it's it's a very sobering afternoon you would spend or morning to go through the, uh, through the museum. They have the whole history of the rise of National Socialism, the Nazi movement, it's, it's race, racial uh, Aryan supremacy uh, teachings, and, and it's anti-Semitism especially. They didn't just persecute the Jews, but mostly them. And, and then it gets even more just terrifying as you're actually on a cattle car, what it was like to be gathered in there, just to, it's a real rail car that they had uh, that went to Auschwitz. And then seeing, tragically, the most affecting of all was the, all the baby shoes that were collected um, that they found in one of these concentration camps. The tragedy is, is just unspeakable. Mm-hmm. And, and you go through this and you learn. It's education. It, the purpose is education for a purpose. And it can be summed up in, in basically two words, a two-word slogan. 
for the Jewish Defense League and others uh, fighting anti-Semitism and all that. It's never again, never again. And you take in that George Santayana quote, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. Put all that together and it's like, oh, I get it now. In heaven, we will say never again. Mm. We will never fight God again. And, and we will know why because we have that history laid out. Now, sadly, if never again isn't just a matter of Jewish genocide, but any genocide, and, and I think most, most people that would say never again want to extend that to, to any genocide. There have been multiple genocides since the end of World War II, mm -hmm. like the, the killing fields in Cambodia, Pol Pot, and all that. It just keeps happening. Mm -hmm. So however much we want to say that World War I was the war to end all wars, it didn't. And however much you may have a museum and you can say never again, we can't guarantee it, but in heaven, we will actually be able to say, never again. Rightly conform to that image that you mentioned, loving yes. righteousness, hating wickedness. What an incredible theme that just keeps coming up, I think, yeah. in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, a story that you've mentioned, Andy, is uh, in Arabian Nights, mm. uh, the man who never laughed again. <laughs> how, has, how has that story maybe helped you understand oh, some man. of these things? Oh, boy. I read that to uh, Daphne this morning. Um, Arabian Nights, A Thousand and One Nights, uh, is a bunch of, of, um, of folk tales from the uh, Arabic-speaking world. They're basically from the Islamic point of view. And uh, some of them you know, are familiar, very familiar, like Aladdin, this lamp, you know, the magic carpet ride, and the Ali Bob and the Forty Thieves, and the, and the cave with the treasures and all that. So those are some images that are familiar. Um, but there's a lot of stories. And one of them is The Man Who Never Laughed Again for the End of His Days. And it's an amazing story, and, and, it, and it teaches a point. I'm not going to go through all the details, but basically it's a, it's a well-to-do young man who loses all of his wealth, squanders it like the prodigal son, mm -hmm. gets hired by a man to come and be in a, in a very nice mansion to care for 10 other sheiks along with this man. Um, but he's, he's hired on condition that he never ask ever the reason why they spend all day weeping. So they, they, he comes in there, he agrees to the terms, and he serves them very, very well, these old men, and he brings them tea, and he feeds them and cares for them, and he, and he grows to love them. But they weep all day long. Mm -hmm. And it's just every day begging the question, what happened? But, but it's just part of the deal, is he's never going to ask. So one by one by one by one, they all die. Finally, the guy who originally hired him is on his deathbed. So this, this young man comes, and he stands to inherit the whole house and all that. He's going to be fine, but he's got to ask, why? He said, I'm begging you not to ask. I, I love you like a son. Please don't ask. So he's literally, on uh, you know, a week later, he's going to die that day. And he said, please tell me why you're weeping. He said, well, I'm not going to tell you, but there's a door in the garden, and it's, it's locked with four locks. I'm telling you, don't go down that, that, don't go through that door. If you do, you'll know why, but I'm begging you not to. Well, the man dies, he inherits a house, and he's there. He walks by the door the next day and looks at it. <laughs> Got a sense of where uh, Yeah, you see where this is going. Right and yeah. so, you know, it, he lasts a week before finally breaks open the lock, goes down, and, and it's this long kind of corridor that comes out by a river. Uh, and the, this river, and it's like he didn't even know any of this was there. Mm. Suddenly, a massive eagle comes and grabs him and carries him between heaven and earth, some long distance, drops him on an island. Some, you know, he's there for some days. Then a ship comes and rescues him off the island and brings him to another land that is the most beautiful he's ever seen. Mm. And long story short, he ends up becoming king, married to a beautiful wife, ruling over this beautiful land. Really, it's the Islamic picture of paradise in mm. heaven. So it's just incredible situation, but there's a condition there. There's a door in a garden and he's not supposed to go through that door. Sure. Well, let me tell you something. First of all, this dude, he lost his original wealth from his dad. Mm -hmm. he, he can't obey, he can't just be happy where he Stay is. Stay put, Stay. don't go don't through the do door. That. But he can't do it. And so he goes, you know, he says, look, I mean, I went through it last time. Look what happened, just got better and better. This could be even better. Sure. Goes through the door eagle is waiting for him and he runs and tries to escape but that that eagle picks him up in his talons brings him back to the riverbed where he first got him lets him go and then flies off so he's like standing there waiting for him to come back all right i'm get, I, I get it i'm sorry whatever eagle never comes back he's there for weeks waiting mm. finally he goes back up the hallway through the door into the original garden closes the door locks it all up again and spends the rest of his life weeping 
Paradise Lost. All right, what does that have to do with, well, it's a cool story, but um, what, is it, what does that have to do with my book? Well, imagine we have the memory wipe, but we're basically told this is a happy world. There's a doorway, and it's got a word over it, evil. Don't go down that doorway. And we don't know what evil is. You're basically back in the garden being tested all over again. We don't have any history. We have no knowledge whatsoever. Mm. Instead, God shows a different way. We went down through that doorway. We went down that hallway. Mm. We went, we, we went, and we didn't go paradise. We lost the Garden of Eden. And we went through a miserable journey for 6,000 years. We know what that journey is. Uh, entails. So I guess the idea is there's not going to be that mystery up in heaven saying, don't do this. We will know. Mm. Well, Andy, before we move to some applications here and some final questions and then final thoughts, uh, which we'll spend a little bit of time on the application. So I don't mean to say that we're ending soon, yeah. but just, um, why else will it be good to see how God defeated such sins? And you've mentioned mm-hmm. some of these, but uh, one being racism yeah. or another bitterness. You sure. Think of yeah, I mean, think of the, the sweetness of reconciliation, mm-hmm. knowing the backstory. Um, you know, we've already talked about that, and I think we covered some of it. But just sure. imagine David and Uriah the Hittite, best of friends in heaven. Or even, like I said, Corey Ten Boom and that SS yeah. guard. Being able to see how, how imperfect were human relationships and how hurtful was sin. And to see how much the blood of Christ... And the redeeming work, the powerful transforming work of the Spirit, how completely they solve the problem. That's going to be very, very satisfying. So to have ancient enemies be able to sit at table, I mean, not mocking in any way, but the Hatfields and the McCoys of this world yeah. who are feuding, mm. but actually some from each of the groups really genuinely loving each other in heaven. How beautiful is that? That's ah, incredible. And I think that that flows well <clears throat> into us thinking about some, some application points. Okay. So what are some present benefits Mm -hmm. that we get from a healthy meditation on heaven? Okay. So I think the the benefits that come to us, let's start with the two journeys, Mm -hmm. okay? The internal journey of holiness and the external journey of gospel advance through evangelism and missions, all right? I think a really robust, continual meditation on heaven helps both, all right? So first of all, in our battle for holiness, just understand uh, that as we are fighting sin, every triumph that we have over temptation will be rewarded in heaven, remembered and rewarded. Um, It will, I believe, and we can talk about this in a minute, but I think it actually expands our capacity to enjoy heaven. So the more we put sin to death, the more we will enjoy heaven. Hmm. There will be no regrets at all. I'm just talking about capacity. Um, Also, I believe the more generous that we are, if we are not stingy, but generous of our time, our energy, our money, giving to the poor and need, giving to missions, the more that we do that, um, Jesus said the measure you use is the measure you will receive, but he clearly indicated we should want it in the next world, not in this world. We should be quiet about our good deeds and and get rewarded in the future. Mm -hmm. Not now. Not receive our reward in full now. So what that means is the measure we use now is the measure we'll receive in heaven. And so the more you have this heavenly mindset, the more vigor you'll have in holiness and putting sin to death, the more, more delight you'll have in doing good for others. Also, it sets you free from being envious or jealous of other brothers and sisters, anything that God gives them in this life, or in terms of spiritual benefits for the next world. We actually will want our brothers and sisters to be as rich as possible on Judgment Day. We will do everything we can to expand other people's successes, Mm -hmm. not in competition with them, but delighting to expand their experience of heaven that it just changes the way you look at everything in this life in terms of personal holiness. In terms of evangelism and missions, we want other people to share this joy with us. We want them to be with us in heaven. Uh, We aren't afraid. It helps us to lose our fear of man, of persecution. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. So he actually said, don't fear persecution, think about heaven. Hmm. Stephen is being martyred, and he's definitely thinking about heaven. He, he, he is heavenly already. He's already there. 
He's not even dead yet, and he's already transported. And that just gives a beautiful testimony. Mm -hmm. Also, the more heavenly-minded we are, the better we'll suffer. We'll suffer cancer better. We'll suffer um, financial afflictions and economic reversals. We're in a time in which our nation is facing some of the greatest economic challenges uh, in you know since the Depression. And, and there's, there are challenges that are going to come down the pike. People will need to be heavenly minded. And as stuff gets taken away, earthly stuff gets taken away, mm. providentially taken away, we could end up bitter or we could end up instead trusting and hoping and, and knowing that, that, that this world is not our home, but heaven is our home. Mm. So those are a lot of the benefits that come from a robust meditation on heaven. That's great. I don't know that it's in here, but just in in our conversations and, and thinking about uh, ideas, even from the most recent book that you wrote, mm -hmm. thinking about contentment, mm -hmm. how, how does that play into some mm -hmm. of this, particularly as you talked about how we might suffer, mm -hmm. but also suffer well mm -hmm. right now as we experience this time of coronavirus, COVID-19? It's a beautiful question. Contentment really is an, an embracing of the providence of God, a delighting in the providence of God. And what is God providing ultimately for us but heaven? He's providing mm -hmm. eternity. And everything is working together for good mm -hmm. to get us to heaven. And so the more we're thinking about heaven, we're on board with the destination of the journey. Yeah. I mean, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road leads to destruction, that is hell, mm -hmm. and many enter through it. Mm -hmm. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, that's heaven, and only if you find it. Uh, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's heavenly language. The Bible ends in heaven, Revelation 21, 22. So you, you look at that, and the more that you are, are drinking that in, etc., the more peaceful you'll be in affliction. Mm. The more on board with what God is doing, what God is doing right now. As Paul said, our light and momentary afflictions are working in us a weight of glory that far outweighs them all. That's mm -hmm. heavenly meditation put to practice right there. So it makes us content in the midst of suffering. That's great. And I think it loosens our, our grasp, <clears throat> too, on this life, knowing that this is not ultimately our home. And yeah. so whatever the Lord chooses to give or take away ultimately is for our good that we would experience great joy in heaven. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, you preached a sermon entitled, how much heaven do you want? Mm. Interesting title. Uh, <clears throat> there, you combined a resolution from Jonathan Edwards and a promise from Jesus Christ and a short story by Leo Tolstoy. So yes, interesting title, three an incredible that... combination <clears throat> of things here to get us to that end. So yeah. let, let's talk about that. I think that okay. was a that was a helpful uh, idea for me in understanding this idea of rewards. But let, let's okay. talk about that sermon. Later. All right, well, let's start with the resolution. Um, well, no, let's start with Jesus' promise. Why don't you read the, the statement in Revelation, mm -hmm. uh, Revelation 22, 13, I think it is. Uh, 12. 12. 12. All right, yep. go ahead. It says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give it, uh, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. So those are works based rewards. I will give to people according to what they've done. Mm. My reward is with me. I'm coming soon. So he's talking about rewards. Yeah. So that's the first aspect is we're talking about rewards that are based on works. Now read the, uh, the Edwards resolution. Okay. <coughs> Resolved. To endeavor to obtain for myself as much happiness in the other world as I possibly can with all the power, might, vigor, and vehemence, yea, violence I am capable of or can bring myself to exert in any way that can be thought of. It's one of the most remarkable things I've ever read. Hmm. That was a resolution written by a teenager. That's amazing. <laughs> the theological... I, I mean, was not writing things like this when I was a teenager. He was a theological close. prodigy like Mozart. Unbelievable. But what he's saying is he's, he's determined to live a certain way. Hmm. He uses language like vehemence and vigor and even violence. He's going to fight. He's going to fight his own fleshly tendencies. He's going to fight the world and the devil. He's going to he's going to energetically live his life. To what end? Well, in that resolution, it's to obtain as much happiness mm -hmm. for himself in the next world as he can. So as much, so that's a quantifiable happiness. Yeah. More or less. More or less. So the more vigor and the more energy I put into this, the more heavenly happiness I'll have. Mm. So that clicks into something that Edwards later wrote about, uh, heaven is a world of love, on the variability of heavenly experience, mm. variability of heavenly glory, the variability of uh, heavenly position, 
um, uh, the variability of glory. These things, I think, are true. I think not every Christian life is equal to every other Christian life. And I think, though every saint will be perfectly happy in heaven, I don't believe every saint will be equally happy in heaven. Mm -hmm. There will be no dark clouds, no covetousness, no problems. Just, I believe, in a, an expansive volume of taking in the glory of God. Mm. So none of us can take it all in. It's infinite. But imagine a, a vast sea, uh, undulating, beautiful sea of glory. And then different size vessels. All right. And they're all immersed full, completely full. Yeah. But some are bigger than others. And what Edwards is saying is how I live my life here on earth will affect how much of God's glory I will take in and experience and delight in, in heaven. And I want as much as I can get. So that really is a life of exertion, energy, of drive, not to the end that our sins will be forgiven. That's justification by works. But a maximization of our treasure in heaven, which is God, a maximization of our experience uh, with God. So... A number of years ago, I preached a sermon uh, on Matthew 16, where Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Mm. Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? And at that point, I was aware of uh, a short story written by the Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy, which Irish novel novelist James Joyce called the greatest short story ever written. Mm. So another novelist said, this is the best, this is the best short story I've ever read. This is the best story, short story I've ever read. And it was entitled, How Much Land Does a Man Need? So I kind of stole that and changed it. <laughs> I started with, how much heaven does a man need? And I kind of morphed it into, how much heaven do you, do you want? And, and, and that's where you ended up. How much heaven do you want? How much of heaven do you want? How big a diameter? So in the story, Leo Tolstoy is written in Tsarist Russia, 19th century Russia. There's a, a, a merchant named Payam who is discontent with his lot in life. He's not satisfied with how much he has uh, in this world. Mm -hmm. And he knows that in that society, and in most societies, uh, it all came down to land. Uh, you needed to be a landowner if you were going to be truly wealthy. Yeah. And he uh, didn't really see any prospects for owning land in, in his uh, community there, in his village. He tried various things, but he made a boast. He made a certain statement. If I had enough land, even the devil himself couldn't tempt me. Well, in the, in the story, the devil heard it. <laughs> but he was hiding behind the stove. And he heard what Payam said, and he said, this is my version, 21st century. It's on now. Yes. <laughs> All right, we're going to go after this guy, and we're going to use his ambition to destroy well, what, what ends up happening is Payam tries to get land there. He can't get it. But then he hears a tale, a story that he finds out is true of a tribe of people beyond the Ural Mountains, you know, way out to the east. And um, they are the Bashkir people. And they're selling huge tracts of arable land for very little money. So he sells everything he possibly can sell and gets a thousand rubles together and makes the long, arduous journey out to the Bashkir land. And when he arrives there, he, through a translator, finds out from the chieftain, the Bashkir chieftain, it's all true. Hmm. Uh, they're selling land, and the land is beautiful. It's rich and dark and arable, and it's going to be amazing. Hmm. And already he's salivating, pay him a salivating. It's like, well, what's the price? And the answer is the price is a thousand rubles per day. Say so thousand rubles per day. <laughs> what is what does that mean? I was thinking you'd say per acre or whatever. No, no, no. It's a thousand rubles for however much land a man can walk around in a single day. Mm. But here are the rules. You have to begin and end from the same place. You have to begin right at sunrise and you have to get back before sunset, or you lose all your money. You get nothing. It's all or nothing. And you have to travel on foot. And that's it. And however many he said, but a man can walk around a huge tract of land in a day. And they laughed. And they said, well, then a man will have a huge tract of land. <laughs> well, he, Payam is so excited he can't sleep. Because he goes, goes and scouts out. It's hilly and, and well-watered and just beautiful. And as he looks, um, he, he just can't, can't wait. So he, he's, he's almost like up all night so excited. 
By the way, in the story, the devil's outside the tent rubbing his hands with glee. All right. So he gets up a great while before dawn. He goes to the top of a, of a hill and meets the chieftain there with a bunch of people. And the sun hasn't risen yet, but he's ready. He said, well, how am I going to mark the land? They give him a spade and they say, just dig holes to mark it. And we'll see where it's piled up and that will mark your land. And that'll be it. So the sun rises and the chieftain throws down his cap and said, this is the start and end place. Go. So off he goes. He goes down the hill and he starts traveling in the direction he's already figured out where he wants to go. And he's traveling along. And I like to picture it like um, like a baseball diamond. First, second, third, and home. Yeah. So he goes along toward first base, so to speak. And as he's traveling, it, it just gets better and better. Mm. And he's just about to dig the hole and make the first turn, but he sees a copse of fruit trees and some a stream. Got to have it. So he goes up a little further, and then finally he digs the first hole and makes the turn. But now he's getting, he's getting hot. The sun is is getting up high. He's starting to worry a little bit. He said, "I might have bit off more than I can chew." So he he goes faster. He takes off his coat. He's actually walking very rapidly now. Mm -hmm. He makes the sh second leg, let's say from first to second, a, a quite a bit shorter. And 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 he digs the second hole. Now he's going back, but the sun is hurtling across the sky you know how days can be like that mm -hmm. and and you're trying to get something done and and it's it's going and the afternoon is wearing on quickly and he's getting really tired yeah. and so he goes along maybe even a diagonal line more or less back to where he started and digs the third hole and now he's turning to go and he has like no strength left no energy left and 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 the sun is setting there's no doubt about it and he's still got a good distance to get back to that hill he has definitely bit off he feels more than he can chew and he gets to the base of that final hill and it's steeper than he remembers it's like a mountain mm. he's so exhausted and he just throws down the, sh the shovel and he gives up because the sun is set but the the Bashkir people from the top are saying, what are you doing? The sun hasn't set yet. We can still see the sun. They're up on the mountain, mm. on the top of the hill. Yeah. Get up. Don't what give up. Mean? So they're exhorting him. And he gets up. It's like the last mile of a marathon. And he's laboring up this hill. And at the last minute, just before the sun sets, he dives and grabs the cap. Made it. Made it. Uh, and they're going crazy. They've never seen anyone go walk around such a big tract of land. And they're saying, what a fine fellow. What an incredible piece of land. Problem is, there's blood coming out of Payam's mouth. He's dead. Mm. Whereupon, they take the shovel and they dig a hole of a certain size, about six feet down, and they put him in it. And that answers Tolstoy's question, how much land does a man need? That. So it's really a warning against earthly ambition. Mm -hmm. And that's how I preached it in Matthew 16. What would it profit a man if he should gain the whole world for mm -hmm. the soul? But then I thought about Edward's resolution. Resolve to gain as much heavenly territory as I can get. So then I thought, huh. And I flipped the story over. I said, imagine if, in a heavenly uh, sense, in terms of heavenly ambition, if, if Payam got up and uh, just gets out of tent at sunrise and gets, saunters up to the top, and they're waiting, wondering where he is. Where you been? Where you been? And he brings a chair, and he says, the view up here is amazing. And he sets up, in, like you can picture, like a comfortable recliner almost. And the sun rises, and they're looking at this guy like, what are you doing? And he's got his shovel across his lap, and around about 10.30 in the morning, he gets up, stretches, goes down about 30 feet and digs a hole. And goes over about 20 feet and digs another little hole. And then just goes straight back to the chair. Spends the rest of the day looking at the scenery. That's a picture of a comfortable, maybe Western, mm -hmm. affluent, easy life that cares very little about heavenly glory. Mm -hmm. And the question really then is, how much heaven do you want? Are you willing to change the way you're living in order to gain more of God's glory in heaven? Now, you could say, it doesn't matter what I do. No matter what I do, I'm going to be happy in heaven. But that's not the way to think. The question is, if you really love God, you're going to want more of him. You're going to want to have more experiences. You're going to want to do more for his glory. Again, not for the forgiveness of sins, but for the expansion of his kingdom, for the growth in holiness, for all that that entails. And you will enjoy heaven more. So how much heaven do you want? That's a, a good application of our, of our studies. Yeah. It's so helpful. Just to think how that affects our lives now. Mm -hmm. I've loved even what you said, I think maybe in the same sermon as you preached it, 
the idea that that makes us long for one another's success. You think yeah. about when we talk about spurring one another on yeah. to love and good deeds, it's like, because I want that for you. Yeah. Because we want that for you, that we long to see one another as happy, as full of joy in heaven as possible. Any final thoughts as we wrap up this time and our conversations on heaven uh, together? That was it. That's I think it. that's the final thought. <laughs> I love it. it. Just live openly, courageously, aggressively for the next world and look at all that will happen in this world. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's it. That's awesome. Andy, would you pray for us that we would pursue that aim? Father, thank you for the nine weeks that Wes and I have been talking about heavenly memories, about the backward look. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to live lives that are full of good deeds, rich in good deeds, mm -hmm. that we would be sacrificial, that we would be courageous, that we would be bold in evangelism, that we would be bold in holiness, putting sin to death, that we would do those things that you have called us to do. Thank you for this study, and we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you for listening to this resource from twojourneys.org. Feel free to use and share this content to spread the knowledge of God and build His kingdom. Only we ask that you do so for non-commercial purposes and in accordance with the copyright policy found at twojourneys.org. Two Journeys exists to help Christians make progress in the two journeys of the Christian life, the internal journey of sanctification and the external journey of gospel advancement. We do this by exporting biblical teaching for the good of Christ's church and for the glory of God.